today I want to take you on a journey. I want to take you on a journey about what could be. A vision of the future. Are we satisfied with where you are? Now, if you have been invested in certain things, if you invested within a company or your 401k, you every once in a while you would like to evaluate how those investments are doing. And many of you over the last three years, you looked at your 401k or 403b or your annuities and you're looking and say, man, I'm going backwards instead of forwards. And many of you have changed your investment strategies in your portfolio over the last three or four years because it has been stagnated or declining. Is not that true? Maybe it was just me that did that. But when we looked at our investments or our portfolio, we noticed that we were losing money instead of gaining money in our investments. So it's one of those things when you start looking at how it is working, either we step back and say, I'm satisfied with the status quo, I'm satisfied with the investments, I'm satisfied with the return, or we have to say, let's stop, let's evaluate, let's look at what is taking place, let's investigate, and let's find out what's best for our investment. Over these next three months, I want to do that exact same thing with the church, with Glenville. We want to evaluate what does our future look like? What can we do? What can we inspire to become? Or are we going to be on a ship floating in the middle of the sea hoping that we come to port in one piece? You know, I think God's glory for this church is so much better than being on coast mode hoping that we'll be okay. We have invested, I have invested 15 years of my life at this church. And I'm looking at what my investment is. And my investment that I'm talking about is not the financial gain of what I have had over the last 15 years. What I want to look at, how many lives have we changed? How many people have given their life to Christ? How many kids have been baptized? How many people have been changed because of the ministry? And if we look at our investments and we look at how we are doing, we can have a vision of what God wants us to do 20 years from now, 15 years from now. When our kids are in charge of the church, how are we leaving them a legacy of hope, of joy, of Christ-centered church? You know, the message of Jesus Christ will never change. It is the message that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. That will never change because that is the biblical mandate that we proclaim. Would you give me an amen? Amen. But how we proclaim that message has to be fresh. It has to be something that, that gravitates to the soul. So when young people that are struggling in life, they're in debt over their ears, that are broken, that are hurting, that, are, that, that spiritually they're in decline, physically they're struggling, why do they come to a church? Do they come to a church to hear a sermon? Absolutely not. They come to the church to get a hold of Jesus. They come to a church where they can get a hold of something that can change their life. And we have to put a focus. What are we doing Are we doing church correctly? Or have we became church? Are we satisfied with church? I don't want to be satisfied. I want to do something bigger than ourselves. I want to ask God to show up and radically change the thought process of how Glenville relates to the world. How we can bring up a younger generation that has a passion for Christ. They may do things differently, and they should do things differently. But as long as they have a passion for Christ, and they proclaim the message of Jesus, let us embrace. Let us do whatever we need to do to reach a lost and dying and hurting world. We have to do that. You know, in the Purpose Driven Church, a few years ago, Rick Warren came up with a book the purpose-driven church. I want to give you the analogy, and I want to give you the conclusion before I give you the start. The conclusion of the purpose-driven church is we have a wide variety of people to minister from, but it boils down to a core. And the core, that is the church. How are we growing is determined on how strong the core, the, the lay leaders the ministers, the people that are doing the work of the ministry, until our core 
becomes solid. And it looks out and branches out to reach into the world. We have become stagnated. And if we stagnate ourselves, what we're saying is, church is for me. I like the status quo. But if our core is saying, embrace, bring others in so we can grow, what happens is we exponentially grow to a point that God is blessing our church because we have a core value, and the core value is church is not for me. Church is because of him, and there are broken and dying people out there that need a relationship and touch for Christ, and I am a vehicle in which God is allowing me to use, so I get to do what he's called me to do. The first circle is our community. Our community is anybody that we, we can communicate to, anybody of your sphere of influence, anybody that you go to work with or you go to school with, anybody that we have an opportunity to communicate about God or about the church. That is our community. That's our, that's our outreach opportunity. The second one is the crowd. Those are the people that have actually sometime over the last few years have come to our church, whether it's through upward basketball, upward soccer, whether it's through worship, whether it's through Easter, whether it's on Sunday morning, whether it's a baptism, whether it's a children's program, whatever the case is, they actually walked in our door. They actually know what the church looks like. They actually know what goes on. They actually have seen Glenville in action. That's the crowd. That's our pulling force. And then it comes to the congregation. Those are the people that, that that's you. That's on a normal day you come to church. You, you would identify, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to Glenville. And maybe once a month. I may be 30 minutes, well, 30 minutes late. And that would be typical. But we, you know, we come to church and we call Glenville our home. And then we come to the committed. Those are the ones that I tie to the church. I minister at the church. I, I'm committed to, if I'm going to go to church, it's going to be Glenville. And then it hits the core. The core are those that you sacrifice. You say, Pastor, if that needs to be done, I want to do it. I, I will sacrifice, I'll do whatever I need to do in order to bring glory to God and grow the church. Here's, here's what I was challenged with over the last couple of weeks. I was challenged by a, a, a great communicator of saying, if somebody would ask you, how large your church is, what would you say? And of course, the first answer I said, well, we had 1,140 on Easter. Or I would say, we had a little over 700 on Mother's Day. You know, because that's the highest number, so I wanted to, yeah, we got a big church. And he goes, that's not the size of your church. You know what the size of your church is? It's the core. The size of your church is not how many people sit while you preach. It's how many people serve when you're done. The core. So a church running six, seven hundred people, the size of the church is 20% of that. It may be as low as a hundred people or 125 people. You want to motivate a pastor? Tell everybody, you know, the size of my church is when I got there, we ran 500. Now, we run 125. Why? It's because the core is the symptom of of health. And if we do not have a healthy core, we will never reach out and be committed. We'll never reach out to the crowd. We'll never reach out to the community. But if our core grows, if we have a bigger core, if we look at, well, how can I do to serve? What can I do to do things? What we have to do is we have to say, what can I do different? How can I become who God wants me to become? There's a story that uh, I was challenged with, and uh, I love, I, I love leadership. I love John Maxwell and his leadership, and I love different people that write, different authors that, that communicate to me. And, and he was sharing this story, and it brought an understanding, enlightenment to me. And I want to use this illustration and then tie it into our church. The illustration is found in Exodus chapter 18. Moses just led the people out of Israel, out of Egypt. He led the people out of Egypt, and they were in captivity, and he went to the, to the Mount of God. And he was, he was the leader. And he went up and his father-in-law, Jethro, came down to see him. 
And they started to talk, and they started to talk about everything that took place. And Moses started to articulate, this is what Pharaoh did, this is what God did, this is what Pharaoh did, this is what God did. And God miraculously delivered us out of the hands of Pharaoh. And Jethro was very excited for Moses. So after the communication, Moses went to work the next day. And Jethro watched him work. And Moses was the judge. He went over and he was communicating. He, he tried to settle all the disputes. And if there's any issues that take place, they would bring it to Moses. So all the way early in the morning till late at night, Moses was setting over disputes, trying to figure things out. And he was trying to teach him the very things of God and why God wanted to do this and what the Bible said about this. So Moses was settling disputes all day long. And Jethro came up to him and he said, why are you doing that? And let me pick it up in verse 17 of Exodus chapter 18. It says, So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing you do is not good. Both you and these people who you are with will surely wear yourselves out, for this is too much for you, and you are able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God and the people so that you may bring difficulties to God. Let me bring the scenario. Jethro said, you're not going to be able to keep it up. You may be, in their eyes, the leader. And they may look to you. And you may like that you are needed. But it's not healthy for you, or it's not healthy for the church, or a country. So what you have to do is you have to decide, do you want to be valued as the leader to everyone, or do you want everyone to be part, and God can bring glory to the church or to a country? So I was motivated, and I wanted to share with you seven things as what Moses decided out of fresh eyes when Jethro came to him, and he said, Moses, it's not good. You're not going to be able to sustain it. It's not healthy. People are not satisfied. So if somebody comes into our life and they say, what you're doing is not healthy, what you're doing is not good, let me tell you what God would have you do. And Jethro communicated that to Moses, and at that time, Moses decided, I need that. I need somebody to speak value into my life. I'm going to open my eyes up, and I'm going to listen to him, and I'm going to follow through with what he said. So here's what he did. Moses changed his way of thinking first. He listened to Jethro, and he had to change the way he thought. He did not think that he had to be in charge, that he had to let other people take charge. And then he changed his way of working. First he changed his way of thinking, and then he changed his way of working. Until we first change our thought process of what we could do or what we should do, we'll never change our work ethic to allow other people to do what God wants them to do. And if we don't change the way we think or change the way that we work, our core will never expand. We'll never expand. So let me give you these seven things. And these things are good, so write them down. If, if you don't write them down, I'll tell you to write them down over here because these are really good stuff, really good. The first, he became a man of prayer. He became a man of prayer. We should never try to accomplish something that God is not involved with. If we, if we have to pray about something, if we need something, we should ask God to show us, to give us that insight, that, that, that power from God, that what we are doing is from God. We may take risks. We may fail at certain things. But as long as we know that God's in the middle of it and God's going to show up beside us, we need to be men and women of prayer in verse 19, it says, Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that you may bring the difficulties to God. So the first thing Moses, as a leader of a country, did to change his thought process, Jethro said, pray about it. Tell the people you're praying about it. Quit thinking that you are God and that you can make decisions, and you can tell everybody what to do, let people know that they can talk to God. You give them the godly advice that God would have them. Let them know that you are praying to God. Become a man or woman of prayer. In the little things, in the great things, 
Let people see that God is the priority. Not your image, not what you want them to perceive, but what does God want you to do? And if we evaluate the first leadership challenge of Moses is to take your eyes off of ourselves and put our eyes firmly onto God and communicate what God would have us to do. And then commu committed himself to communication. Committed himself to communication. To communicate. In verse 20 says, And you shall teach them the statutes and the law. You shall teach them. It's not about what we do. It's about why we do what we do. It's not about trying to be so out there, so cutting edge, so people will gravitate to us because we're fresh and we're new and we're the newest thing. No, I think we should do whatever God wants us to do, but we have to always bring it back. It's not about the show, it's about Jesus Christ. Bring it back to a point that we'll do whatever we need to do in order to reach people for Jesus Christ, but in that, it is to teach them the statutes of God. What does God have for their life? A church is not going to change somebody's life. Pastor Thomas will never change your life. You know who's going to change your life? It's Jesus. Jesus has the transforming power to bring broken things to light, to allow us to have freedom in Christ. But we have to be committed to communicate the truth. In any vehicle, in any avenue, in any way that we go, we have to be able to communicate the truth and never be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Never be ashamed. You know, it's easy to communicate Christ on a Sunday morning. It's easy to raise your hands and worship God. It's easy to talk about how Jesus loves us and how Jesus forgave us. It's easy to proclaim the message and say, I'm not ashamed of Christ. It's much more difficult in your workplace or at school. It's much more difficult when you're the minority and people are making fun of you. And I believe that's when Jesus tells us, be yourself. Live your life pleasing to God. Let your testimony be a light in a very dark world. Never lose your testimony because of someone else. Stay faithful to Christ and communicate the truth in life. And when you do that, people will see that there's a difference because in the middle of adversity, you can still communicate the truth without preaching. You can just live your life. And then lay out or cast a vision. And that's what I want to do today. As Moses laid out, he said this in verse 20, And you shall teach them the statutes and the law, and show them the way in which they must walk. When I look at what Moses was challenged by Jethro to do to, his, to, to Israel, it is the same thing that what I and the leadership must do to a church. Cast a vision. To be a visionary. To think about what we could be 15 years from now. To think about what we do today is going to impact kids' lives. Our kids' lives. Your grandkids' lives. Are we going to be a church that brings up a generation that has a passion and love for Christ? Or are we only going to think about what we used to do 20 years ago? What we used to be when the church grew or when the church got started? What we have to do is we have to start thinking, that was a great day. That was behind us, but a new generation is dawned. And what are we going to do to impact five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 20-year-olds, young marrieds that are 30 years old that have never had a relationship with Christ, and they think religion is old-fashioned? How can we communicate to them there is absolute truth and the Word of God can change their life? We have to be genuinely real and authentic, authentic to them so they know that Jesus is real within our life. We have to be able to communicate that. We have to have a power and a vision within our life. It's not going to just happen. If we look at every other church and every other model in every other city or in every other, in other church in Wichita, we can look at every other church. And there's not going to be a model that fits Glenville when we look at any other church. You know why? It's because the Bible says Jesus brings into the body who he wants the church to have. And the church is unique because there's no structure, there's no model, there's no frame that says you have to be this way, you have to be this way, that you have to be this way, you have to be this way. No, when God brings uniqueness 
into a church. It is for a purpose. And modeling another church is okay, but it's not what God wants. God wants every person to move into the core to say, this is my spiritual giftedness. This is what I am. This is who you made me to be. What can God do with who I am? The greatest thing about salvation is not just heaven. It's, it's God uses who you are. He doesn't change your personality when you get saved. He doesn't say, okay, you have to act like this guy. You have to be in this box. You can't step out of this box. When you get saved, you're just a child of God, and you are who you are. Now, he wants to transform you so you're not living a lifestyle that's outside of God's will, but your essence of who you are, your personality, who you want to be is under God's hand. And if we take all of our personalities, unique, dysfunctional, and say, what can God do with me? That's when our core grows. And that's when we can influence a community because we're not in a box. We don't have to be in a cookie-cutter mindset. We can step out and we can say, you know what? I am doing this for the cause of Christ. I want people to radically be changed and transformed because of my impact within their life. Not because we just go to church, not because we have music, not because we have a drum, not because we have preaching, because we have Jesus. And if we can communicate that and have a passion and a vision for the future, that's when God does great and mighty things. And then we have to develop a plan. It doesn't do us any good to cast a vision. It doesn't do us any good to dream. It doesn't do us any good to think of what we could be if we're not willing to do what God wants us to be. We have to look at that and say, what are the nuts and bolts of ministry? How can we accomplish the goal? And in verse 20, in the last sentence, it says, and the work they must do. You have to communicate the work that they must do. So over these next three months, my challenge to you is to show you what a dream could be, what the reality of the future should be. Now, I'm not telling you I know exactly what God is going to do within our church. I wish I did. But what I do, uh, what I do want to communicate to you is I want to have a passion. I want to have a vision that we, the church, can be so overwhelmed with God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's power that when we look back over the next two years, we're going to look at, it's a new day. The best days, <laughs> they were great days. But the better days are in front of us. And we have to be willing to pass the baton. We have to be willing to let others use what God has given to them. And then we, we have to equip them and challenge them to give their time and give their resources and develop a plan. And then after that, it comes to number five. Select people who can do the job. You know, the worst thing that we can do is, and don't get upset when I say this. Some of you will. Don't allow incompetence to ruin the future. We have to have competent people leading the way. Competent people means this in the church realm. Somebody has a passion for Christ. They may not be perfect in everything that they do, but they have a passion and a love for Christ. They have a passion and love for the church. They have a desire to see what God is going to do. We select people who can do the job. Uh, in verse 21 it says, Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, a place such over them rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, and rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. So Jethro saying, look at, your, look at your men. And here we can say, look at your men and women. Find out of your congregation men and women that are, that are spiritual, that are healthy. And place over others people that can love them and help them and teach them, that can give to you the vision and accomplish the goal that God has laid in front of you. Select. We have to have men and women that have a passion for Christ, that wants to move to the core. And when we grow the core, what's going to do is going to allow other people to say, you know what? I want to have that same vision. I want to have that same passion. I want to have that same vitality. I want to inspire other people to have a love for Christ. And then in six, we need to release people to do ministry. Release people 
to do ministry. And this is a hard one for a Baptist church. We have to release people to do ministry outside of the box. We have to reach people that would not come to church. We have to think about things inside and outside. I'm not going to be able to do a lot of things outside the church to reach your generation and to your friend, fam, family and friends. But you can look at things that are outside the box and you can do ministry. Ministry is not just at, at Glenville. Ministry is, you're, you represent Jesus Christ. You go to Glenville. And when you represent Jesus Christ outside of Glenville, what happens? It grows the influence of Glenville. But if we only wait to do ministry in the church, what happens is we're waiting for somebody to start a ministry that I can identify with, and if somebody starts a ministry that I can identify, okay, I'll serve there. We have to think bigger than that. I can't start a ministry for you to fit in. I don't know what your spiritual giftedness is. I don't necessarily know what your passion is. But if you can dream big dreams and think big thoughts and say, this is what I need to do because this is what God has called me to do, start Start impacting people for Christ and see what God will do. God can do great things with great visions. And he doesn't need a church to start a ministry for somebody that's started. God uses an individual to have a dream, a vision, and say, I can do that. And it's not necessarily permission, it's opportunity. And then he only did, Moses only did what the people needed him to do. Okay? Let me bring that to the pastor. I can't minister to 700 people every day effectively. I can't do it. If I had to effectively minister to you every week, you would quit this church because the pastor could not do what you expected him to do. Moses could not minister by himself effectively. What he did, he allowed other people to do things that they were capable of and are, were good in, he set aside and he did what only he could do. And all the way in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, it talks about the responsibilities of a leader. And in doing that, there are things that I am required to do and I need to do and I need to do them right. Some things I need to delegate deacons to do, staff to do, and lay ministers to do. And we have to get this mindset. If somebody is a child of God, whether I pray with you over the phone before you go to surgery, or I get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to be at your surgery, which <laughs> I don't want to do that, 2 o'clock in the morning to go to your surgery, God loves you, and somebody can come in and minister to you. Let others be a minister. Let others come alongside you. You will build relationships in the church when you get involved in people's lives. If we just wait for somebody to come up to you on church on Sunday morning and talk to you on Sunday morning, I just don't build any relationships. Well, get out of church. Get involved in somebody's life. Go pray with them. Encourage them. Go play putt-putt with them. Go do something. G get involved in somebody's life, and you will see that when other people start impacting your life, that's when true life change takes place. Well, how does Glenville move to a ministry-driven philosophy? Let me share these real quick. Um, do things others are unwilling to do. That's just called servanthood. Just do things others are unwilling to do. It's below me. It's beneath me. I don't want to do that. I will. I'll do it. Not because I'm overqualified or underqualified. I'll do it because I just love Jesus. I'll serve Christ just because that's what I want to do. And if we have an attitude of servanthood, you know what God does? God smiles at us because it's not arrogance, it's humility. Servanthood. I can serve you. I don't care. If I look at what I can do to serve somebody else and love them and help them along, it's called, I am willing to do what others are unwilling to do. A servant's heart. And then do things that others should do. And that's modeling. I know others should do certain things within the church, but you know why a lot of people don't do things within the church? They just don't know how. They've never been taught. They've never been sh shared with and communicated to. That's just called 
modeling. You know, if somebody tags along long enough, they're going to find out how to do things. We have Brennan Scott. Brennan, raise your hand. Brennan was our youth intern here a few years ago. He's getting ready to graduate from Baptist Bible College next year. And one of the things I loved about Brennan when he was an intern here, he, he drove me crazy sometimes, but he just, he would come to my office, he goes, hey, what do we do here? What do we do here? Hey, can we do this? And I was like, just leave me alone. But you know what he wanted? He just wanted to be taught. He just wanted, he wanted to start a church in the future, and he just wanted modeling. He just wanted somebody to teach him the very integral parts of ministry, how to do this, how to do that. That's what I believe in ministry is called modeling. Just model what you're trying to accomplish. And then do things other, others can learn to do. It's just called equipping. Let me take you. Take somebody beside you and equip them to say, I want to start a ministry. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it could be. I just know that God has given me a desire to do something bigger than what I'm doing now. And if I could do something bigger, and I have no idea what it's going to be, but I need somebody to equip me. You know, the Bible says the job of the pastor is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. My job is to prayer. My job is to communicate the truth. And my job is to teach you to do what God has called you to do. That's called equipping. And if we look at that, doing things, teaching things in order for others to get out of their comfort zone and to do great things for Christ. And then do things others cannot do. There are things that you cannot do. And you know you can't do them. There's other things you can do that other people can't do. The idea there is it takes leadership. And in our country and in the churches today, there's a lack of leadership. A lack of leadership. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do. It's not my fault. What we need to do is I want to stand up in front of you. And I want to say to you, the next 15 years of my ministry until I retire, I want to be a leader that moves us into the future and not stagnates us from the future. And the only way that we're going to do that is if we model what does God want for us? How can God accomplish that within our life? It takes leadership. Now, leadership is not necessarily fun because when you lead, some people can get upset. But I want to lead from a heart of what does God have for us in the future? Remember, we will never change the gospel message of Jesus Christ. What we will change is the methodology in order to accomplish and reach out into our community that when your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids come to church with you, they're going to say, yes. They're not going to turn the switch when they turn 16, 17, 18 years old, and they're going to walk out the door from church because church is irrelevant. We want them to understand that church can be the greatest asset within their life because it's the power of Jesus Christ. How we do that is we have to communicate the authentic realness of Christ, not only in church, but in our life. And we have to be taught that. So what is the result from Moses' change? He was the man. Everybody came to him. Everybody looked at him for leadership. Everybody looked at him for all responsibilities. He'll tell everybody what to do and how to do it. Jethro comes in and he says, it's not good that you're doing that. He had to change his thinking. He had to change his working. But in verse 23, it says this. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all his people will also go in their place in peace. When we do what God wants us to do, two things take place. Number one, strength of Moses, or the strength of the church. And the second thing, the peace of the people. Or the peace of the church. Unity in the body. When we stay singular in focus, stay that what is our future? What does my investment look like? Am I satisfied with that investment? What I'm asking you is the only way that we're going to have sweat equity investment is if we move from the congregation Move to the committed, to the core. The community, to the core. Start taking those steps right down the line of saying, what can I do? 
I want, over the next three months, to challenge you. What could it look like? What could you be? How could God bless you? How could God look and use your negativities or your brokenness or your fears or your insecurities to a point that you can bring somebody alongside you and you can invest within their life? A year from now, they're sitting with you in church. A year and a half from now, you could be baptizing their kids because you invested within their life. Five years from now, they could come up and give a testimony of how God used you and brought you along with them. And because of the impact that you put on their life, their family has radically been changed. The only way that we're going to move our core and blow it up is if we get off center. Take a risk. Do great things. Look into the future and understand sometimes what we're doing is not a good thing. And somebody has to come alongside us and wake us up and knock us off center and say, you must change. We have to do something different. I've said this quote a hundred times, and I love it. If every church is like this church, why do we have this church? We have to be different. God created us to be different. Let's get out of a mold of what we've always done or what every church has done and say, God, what do you want Glenville to look like? And you have a gift, you've gifted us. You've brought us to the family. And if we are going to be a healthy body, every person that you bring into the church, you have gifted, they're part of the body. Give them the the gumption within their life to say, I want to invest into the future of this church. That's my challenge. That's our future. And that's the next three months. And I want to inspire you. I want you to be as motivated as I am. Some of you may be sitting here saying, man, we don't go to your church, Bruce. It's not really a big deal to me. Well, you know what? You should come to our church. And some of you that go to our church... You're coming on Sunday mornings and you're saying, you know what, uh, it's good. I want you to take the next step. And I'm telling you, some of you that are in the core, some of you guys need to back off. What does that mean? Let other people help. Just like I have to do. Sometimes I have to take a step back and say, you know what, I don't have to do that. Somebody else is better than that. Let them do that and I'll take a step back. But you know what, what the bottom line is, we don't want to drop any balls. And we want to make sure everything's taken care of, everybody's taken care of. So some people are doing a lot where other people aren't doing anything. And what we could do is just balance that out and say, let us build the kingdom of God for the right purpose. And that's to reach lost and dying world that's struggling and hurting for his kingdom and for his work. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you for our vision for the future. And Lord, I pray that you will inspire us to move us into the future so we can see what you want us to be. And I, Lord, I, I, I don't want to get in the way, but Lord, I want to lead us to where you want us to go. And Lord, I pray that you will be with every family, every individual, every student, and every child. That Lord, we can impact them and we can help them become who you want them to become. Not to preach to them, but to invest in them, to love them, to encourage them, to teach them what the Word of God and the statutes and the truth is all about. And Lord, that we can grow our core. The purpose of the church is to reach a lost and dying world and to disciple them to be followers of Christ so they can reproduce themselves in you. Lord, give us that passion and that vision to do what you called us to do. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless you.